today. We'll start right now with a, with a panel moderated by Adam Hannestad. Adam works as a journalist for the Danish uh, Daily Politiken. He was a financial reporter at Reuters and Bloomberg before until he joined Politiken and began covering international affairs, including covering the Arctic. He is passionately interested in new technologies and argues disruption is a real word. We'll now find out whether or not disruption is also an Arctic word. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Hannestad. Thank you, Otto. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Uh, and thank you very much, Otto, for that introduction. Uh, yes, I do. I am passionate about technology, but I am equally passionate about the Arctic. And I think we've got a crack panel here today. We've got a really, really tight schedule. I've been uh, bullied into telling you that we will be stopping in about 40 minutes max. And in that time, we have five people, all of them extremely knowledgeable in their fields, who want to talk to you about their, experience and their, their experiences, their visions. So we'll be keeping it tight. Please do remember, of those five people, only one of them is a native English speaker, so if there is a little bit of language problems, please bear over with all of us, including myself. Uh, we are here basically to have a good time, and I really I urge you to, to, to enjoy this panel. And with this, I'd like to welcome the, panel, the panelists, please. I'll start by introducing them. We have uh, the uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Culture, Mr. Bort Folke Fredriksen of the Conservative Party Heure. We have Marit Anasara, who is a Sami Norwegian artist. Uh, we have Timo Jokola, the professor, and, uh, of, uh, professor of Art Education and Dean of the Faculty of Arts in the University of Lapland in Rovaniemi. Christine Lalonde is the curator of the National Gallery of Canada and a special curator of indigenous art, I should underline, and Luba Kozovnikova, who's the artistic director of the well-known art, uh, art collective Pikene Pobruon, the girls on the bridge in Kirkenes. <laughs> and I'd like to kick off with just a short question to each of you, with fairly short answers, because otherwise the time is going to go a lot faster than we really want it to. Uh, we seem to have been, been settled in here in, in, in a like, church-like division. I'm, think, I'm, I'm told this is not on purpose, but uh, <laughs> there's nothing implied here that we are, we are on either side or anything. Uh, I'd like to ask you first, Bord. Yesterday, we heard a lot of presentations about how to strengthen uh, Arctic culture. Oh, thanks, Luba. Um, and we heard some of the spokesmen of the art scene, arts galleries, uh, people who work with arts, who are saying they would love to get some more funds to strengthen the Arctic culture and arts scene. On the other hand, we also had a lot of national representatives who said that art needs to be viewed in an economic context. It needs to have economic worth, as one person said. How do we go about uniting these two viewpoints? Um. First of all, of course, uh, art uh, has a value as itself as art. And we all, all, always have to appreciate that. But I th also think without destroying the value of art, we also can see how much uh, positive uh, uh, development art brings with it. With it. And uh, to strengthen our uh, communities, uh, cities, art is a... Uh, a very, very uh, good thing to uh, to uh, go for, and uh, I think the the mayor from Anchorage uh, said yesterday that art makes the city cool. Uh, quite good uh, saying, quite nice saying. Excellent, uh, excellently put. But I just basically just to add to, to it, where's the money? <laughs> uh, we have to cooperate with uh, all that too. Of course, uh, the national uh, governments can fund uh, something, and uh, local business partners can probably fund something uh, too. Uh, Norway already have a bilateral uh, cultural cooperation with uh, uh, Russia, and uh, pro probably we should see more uh, cooperation like this. And uh, of course, something must be uh, uh, funding too. But I think maybe, I, I think yesterday was a success. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, I think the main measure, uh, measure must be 
uh, we shall continue to fight to make art and culture a topic on the Arctic uh, agenda in the future too. I may get back to this. I didn't really expect you to write out any checks on stage here today. So I'll turn to, uh, I'll turn to Timo. Um, as uh, you're a native of Northern Finland, and you started out as a visual landscape artist, and then slowly moved into academia because you got more and more interested in the way that art interrelates with the idea of identity, specifically Northern identity and uh, cultural self-esteem. And you're now the Dean of the Faculty of Arts at the University of Lapland. We were talking about a lot about Arctic arts and culture, but we didn't talk so much about the role of Arctic art and culture. Is it something that we can use and should use to build up national self-identity, or not, sorry, national, but regional identity? Or is it something that should be used to sell the idea of the Arctic outside the region? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a local northern person, and when I started to be interested about art, it was uh, in the end of the 70s, where all the generation of my age moved to Volvo factories in Sweden. Mm -hmm. But I went to study art, and that was uh, my story to come back to this uh, nature and landscape I loved. And uh, finally, I found a way that uh, I'm, I'm not a such kind of uh, fine artist who, in, who is working with art inside the art institution. I was much more interested about what good art gives to me and then the share to the other people do. And that's why I I'm, I'm call myself also as an art educator, not a school educator, but uh, uh, combining my, <coughs> my art with this kind of aims which uh, should be good for people. And I believe that if people have a strong identity, they can earn their own money and find a way for that as an artist too. I'll get back. We'll, I think we'll get back to this as well. And of course, I want this also to, to be, become a, a discussion. Maybe you disagree. Maybe you agree with some of the things you're hearing. Uh, if I can just turn to another artist, Marit Anasara. Uh, you're a Sami Norwegian visual artist. Uh, and you have become quite famous in Norway, apart, uh, partly for one stunt in which you made a pile of 200 reindeer heads that had been freshly chopped off. Uh, and that was as a protest of Norwegian involvement in Sami reindeer herding con uh, culture in the involvement of the, uh, the, the national government of Oslo in distributing reindeer herd uh, culling, the quotas of, of reindeer. But cutting off 200 reindeer heads seems fairly confrontational, especially to the reindeer. Uh, why did you do this? Well, first of all, to clarify, I didn't chop off the heads. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I work um, by collecting the heads from, from the slaughteries. And um, I can get back to um, several aspects of me using the heads, but if you ask me why I, I did it, um, it was, in my sense, necessary um, to claim a voice in what's happening because um, I don't feel that we ourselves own our history, uh, public uh, history, or our current um, uh, ongoing history. Um, so Pailo um he needed that dramatic hard voice just to cut through. And from then on, I think it's also interesting um, how much um, in this project I, I actually also have to uh, work almost as a journalist, as a storyteller, as a, as a lawyer to some uh, extent also I feel because um, how the, um, the government, how the official um, society has kind of owned our history uh, for so long I need to, to build up um, also my artistic presentation just to be believed because what's happened in the uh, reindeer uh, politics, reindeer herding politics in Norway is that um, 
we, de we definitely had no saying. It's been defined uh, from um, the political power in the South, what is the reality and uh, what is kind of our... Uh, so you're saying basically the story has been hijacked, the culture has been hijacked by the South? Definitely, definitely. And then if you come there with a, a painting, um, it's not uh, strong enough to really... Um, be heard or um, to get a discussion going. Mm -hmm. And why should we be heard? We need to be able to tell our story uh, to be ourselves. Heard or, or if, heard it, if, if we don't discuss um, on the same um, base of reality, then um, of course we cannot solve anything. So for me, Pilosatmi is about um, bringing attention of first of all, what's happening now, like the seriousness of the situation. Uh, but by doing that, I also, <clears throat> I'm aware that I have to fill in a lot of information from our Sami, reindeer herding uh, Sami perspective, both historically and also uh, currently, uh, how the reindeer herding works now, how the um, politics are built up. And, and what you're telling me, what you're saying about storytelling is, is something I, I f consider crucial to this whole discussion about Arctic culture, Arctic arts, in this case, culture as a way of life. But uh, it leads me to your neighbor here in the, in the sofa, Christine Lalonde of the National Gallery of Canada. Now, Christine, you have been working with indigenous arts for two decades, I think, something like this. Mm -hmm. And you have the honor of maybe making the only... Inuit exhibition in New Delhi mm. ever. Mm. Now, we were talking a lot about how to... Your, your countryman, Daniel Chartier, was talking about how to recomplexify the story of the North to make it more than some vague idea than it's something about ice and something about northern lights and maybe a few reindeer and polar bears tossed in. I, for me, what you're doing is fairly key to something like this. How did people in New Delhi receive an Inuit exhibition. Mm. <clears throat> that was a very interesting and uh, somewhat unexpected project at the National Gallery. Um, I should say that um, knowing that it was going to uh, a new audience, um, it was an opportunity to tell the story and the history of Inuit art um, and social history as well, um, as we know it now, not with the hindsight of um, 50, 60 years, um, just um, <clears throat> so that, in fact, the essay I wrote for that, which was an introduction for a new audience, was called True North. And for the first time, it wasn't a whitewashed version of that history. It very much laid out that as the art form was developing and being encouraged, Uh, Inuit were essentially going through a process of internal colonization in Canada. So that was a very interesting project. So that the audience in India actually was uh, perhaps uh, received a more current um, update um, version of the history than actual Canadians. Um, this was the first time the National Gallery had actually showcased its own collection. There was a catalog Um, but it was only available in India. Yeah. So that's still not the case. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of the general public that <laughs> I encountered when I was there, um, the response was interesting because there, um, we're, we're really talking about two extremes in terms of environment and society. Um, yet people there found a commonality in many ways, in fact, in the values mm -hmm. of the society. So for example, Um, the people um, who came to see it, and actually even the people who helped install it, were fascinated by this idea of intergenerational um, family yeah. life, uh, which is still very much the case both in the North and in India, and the importance of hospitality, of food, of sharing. Um, and then also the idea that um, spirituality and mythology are not something that is... Uh, separate from everyday life, and that the beliefs that existed millennia ago, centuries ago, are um, still very active today. 
Um, but the one thing about <clears throat> this exhibition which went abroad is that um, it was hardly the first time that uh, Inuit art has been the face that Canada has put forward. Um, mm -hmm. This was part of the Commonwealth Games celebrations in New Delhi. This is, in fact, um, the idea of Inuit art as part of our national identity has been going on since it first uh, arrived in the form we know it of sculpture, prints, textiles um, in the 1950s. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, it's somewhat ironic that as the Canadian government was essentially forcing Inuit to leave their camp life, to move to communities where they now were part of a cash economy, they saw the arts as part of a way that they could um, survive in that economy. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, they were <clears throat> essentially um, interfering and repressing their own way of life. They were celebrating this art form. They were very proud in the correspondence that I've read of the time. They were very proud of their role in creating this art form. <laughs> and so from the 1950s onward, it has been part of our national identity. Inuit art has never been marginalized in Canada. Um, Hano Yawak Ashavak is a, a good example. She represented Canada uh, in uh, Tokyo at the um, expo there in the 70s. And just even within the last few weeks, our new $10 bill has the work, a work of art by Hanoyuak Ashavak. But the artists have always been marginalized. They have always been left out of the conversation. And the last point I, I just want to make is that um, in terms of the, where we are now and in terms of the Arctic Art Summit, Inuit art has had a role in representing Canada. It's had a promotional role. It's time for a shift. It's very much time for a shift where Inuit art and art in the North has to be for the North. It has to be what means the most to the people who make it and in the communities. Um, it has to deal with the things that are really affecting Inuit today, both the celebration of strong family lives, strong language, but also the trauma. Um, the highest suicide rate in Canada is in Nunavut, mm -hmm. and that has to be addressed before anything. <clears throat> in terms of the arts, culture, society, economics, everything. I think you're putting your finger on something very central here, and we'll be going back to this about art being for the North instead of just of the North mm -hmm. uh, later on. But I just want also to uh, get to Luba Kuzovnikova, who, uh, who is born Russian but has lived so long in Scandinavia that, uh, <laughs> that she practically speaks it like, like the language like a native, uh, including a little bit of time in my home country of accent. Denmark. Ah, okay, yes. <laughs> but on a, we're, you're here as the artistic director of uh, Pekinu Pobruan, but at the danger of making this a political discussion or, or, or global political discussion, which I really don't want. We're meeting here at a time when NATO and Russian planes are buzzing each over over the Baltic and the tone is extremely tense among world leaders. And you are sitting there just 10 kilometers from the Russian border, 50 kilometers for the Finnish border, and you specialize partly in uh, cross-country cultural cooperation. And this is one of the things we're talking about. Uh, Arctic culture and Arctic cooperation cross, across the, the whole polar region. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you, what, what do you need to make more of that and what can it be used for? Art is a bridge and uh, who can do better than Peak and the Pobruin, Girls on the Bridge. Art is a channel of communication. Art is a meeting place. Art is the foundation without which policymakers, politicians, or economists cannot do without or cannot go further. And especially, as you say, in the times of uh, crisis and the time, not crisis, but in the time of oh, it's pretty uh, close, political yeah. tension, uh, mm. tensions, uh, art mm. is become sort of a safe ground, a safe foundation. When the politicians in Oslo, in Moscow, cannot talk to each other because they're on the other camps, uh, um, in, in the opposite uh, camps, then leave it to us. So we, artists, uh, art producers, uh, and people, first of all, who live uh, on uh, the, both sides of the same border, we can handle it uh, during these times. Uh, and um, so, so art in these uh, uh, periods of tensions can become a door opener, you know, for communication. It, be it can also become icebreaker. Um, and especially, you know, up there with Russia, it can become also a nuclear icebreaker. So. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, with this, uh, the, the word is pretty free. Just, if I can just start it off, uh, Bord, you're, you're sitting in the national government. Uh, is she right? Is uh, cultural cooperation a, a, an icebreaker? Yes, I think so. Uh, and it will alway, always be necessary to have channels to communicate. And the nice thing about culture in, in that uh, way is that arts and culture has always been uh, borderless, more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, you have seen this for century after century that uh, the culture uh, and the artists are moving around, getting uh, uh, inspiration from uh, all over. Uh, the Norwegian, uh, the, the most famous uh, acts uh, written by uh, Ibsen is, is written in it Italy and, uh, and Germany, the more, and uh, Edward Munch's uh, paintings was uh, inspired by what he, uh, he learned in Germany. So uh, I think uh, art and uh, culture is a way of communica commu to communicate uh, across borders uh, also now and probably also in the future. But also not only to communicate, but I mean, we, we do raise very important issues, uh, especially in the, time of cri uh, in the time of these political tensions. We can question, we can challenge, uh, we can challenge some status quo, and we are sort of free to do that. Um, Though, so, from like our experience, uh, we see that as a result of our actions, uh, when, for example, uh, for some years ago with Murten Trovik, uh, we were cooperating with North Korean artists. Uh, so that resulted in the end that the Minister of Defense, Minister of uh, Culture and Minister of Foreign Affairs were called in to the hearings to the parliament. But um, everyone managed, you know, and in this sense, uh, when, we, when we, through the arts, uh, uh, we engage both the public and the politicians, so basically everyone, we make everyone responsible to talk, but to talk, maybe on the safe ground, but the safe ground that reaches uh, uh, so many different uh, um, you know, layers of people of the community, both the local community and the international community. Because um, that's also a point uh, um, uh, from where we peak in the stand is, is that when we make, create these meeting places, either through festival or through projects, uh, we do root them locally. Um, by engaging the local community, by touching upon all these relevant everyday v issues. But at the same time, all these everyday issues have very global, um, you know, impact. Uh, so in this case, uh, when we speak something up there, it actually rings the bell across the oceans. But if, if this also implies that, that there, there, is, <laughs> there, there, there is some kind of northern identity also is, uh, that can be linked together by, by this cooperation and make, making each other stronger, is that correct? Um, yeah, I mean, the northern identity, well, we have been talking um, um, for the last uh, almost 20 years uh, about the Barents identity and uh, I think have been successfully building uh, this Barents identity as the one which is, for example, different from, um, you know, North uh, Finnish or North uh, Swedish or North Norwegian or Northwest uh, uh, Russian. Um, uh, we... Uh, <laughs> We can talk about this kind of regional identities, but at the same time, um, I would also sort of question it uh, because we, uh, like, we, it, during these days, we're talking about the Arctic identity, but uh, as, as far as I see, the Arctics are so, there are so many different Arctics, uh, and the Arctic in Hashti is different than, for example, the Arctic in Hirkenes, or the Arctic in Hirkenes will be different uh, uh, of the Arctic in, in Anchorage, and exactly about this diversity of the Arctic voices that, yes, have been considered to be a bit remote, mm. Um, uh, but not uh, anymore. So this kind of diversity, as, as you were uh, saying, also making all these different diverse uh, voices heard, this is, this is uh, something that we need to take care of uh, when we speak about the Arctic uh, identity, but not trying to put some kind of uh, one, uh, one you know, notion, uh, one umbrella that the Arctic identity or the Barents identity is this and that and that. Um, so multiple identities in, in the Arctic, but is, is there something that can be learned from across the borders? What, what do you think, Timo? Yeah, of course, uh, we have been collaborating in the first beginning of University of Lapland, that's uh, part of spectacle, and 
what to learn about that. It has been a great situation to send our students to learn about. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the students in University of Lapland, they are not from the north. They are from Helsinki area. They don't know nothing about the circumstances in the north. But that has been a good situation to, to, to meet the circumstances and learn how the artists and our organization collaborate. So it has been a place to learn about Arctic and Northern identities, plural, definitely. Uh, I think that uh, it's a good, good ex example of that kind of uh, activities, which is uh, uh, not only in, in, in the Arctic area or, or from Arctic area, it is it's fitting with Arctic, Arctic people inside the Arctic area. Yeah. And that kind of uh, future thinking, I, 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 my mind is that we need, even in the artistic education, schooling artists, it's a new, new way of thinking about art. Art has been quite a long time that kind of uh, individual creative thinking, but uh, if we think about the Arctic as a, as a laboratory for art, we need to have such kind of people who have abilities to understand the circumstances, social cultural settings, they need to, the willingness to collaborate not only with, with artists and, and arts, but also this other way of understanding the circumstances, like sciences. So we're basically Social back sciences, to the, for the Arctic. Yeah. Culture for the Arctic and not just of and or from the Arctic. For, for, for the Arctic, it's a little bit, uh, I don't like to say for the Arctic, because uh, art has always been a such kind of uh, Western-centric idea that uh, it's uh, coming from, from Paris to Oslo and finally to Harstad mm. and we deal it here. <laughs> it's coming from somewhere for somebody. It's just a kind of a uh, little bit colonialistic thinking. And, uh, and as indigenous artists are talking about decolonization, it means de definitely the idea to think with, not for. Mm. And, and you were and I think that you said like about that yes. sorry, sorry, beginning. Yeah, yeah. I'm not one to tell uh, people living in the high north what they need or what to do, but as a general, I believe in strong and independent institutions. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very good idea if the universities uh, in the high north is cooperating, uh, the museums, the orchestras, uh, and that this cooperation go directly between the institutions. So it's not everything is a political game. I think that will be build uh, the cooperation wider and do it more uh, more robust. But where, where do, where do the, the, the grassroots artists like uh, Marit or Luba's project, where do they fit into this? Uh, they fit in uh, very well, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, in Norway, we have programs for uh, uh, individual artists uh, who can... Uh, uh, be funded for the, the traveling. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Christian Danielsen here yesterday who pre presented the Norwegian Council of uh, Art and how they were uh, funding projects. I, I think we need a lot of projects also in the high north and for I, the north mm -hmm. and how they could uh, cooperate with uh, other artists uh, uh, in other countries. And uh, I, I think we have... Uh, uh, a window of opportunities just now, uh, especially you and uh, Documenta and uh, the, the success Norwegian uh, artists have there. Uh, and uh, I think we we'll learn. We have to learn from those who have a success and build on that. And, and yeah. I think that needs a response here. Do you have a window of opportunity? Uh, <coughs> yeah, I, I just came there about a week ago, so I'm still processing the whole experience. Uh, for me, it's the first time being a part of such a huge uh, and powerful machinery. And when I work with art, it's, uh, it's like an investigative process. It's uh, a healing process. It's um, a, a communication process. It's so much, but then coming there, it was, uh, for now, my first impression is uh, a little bit like um, the art instead of talking seriously about the issues as we do here when I have Pilosatmi projects in, in our region, it was more, um, for now, um, sensationalized or objectified. In, 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 in what way sensationalized? Uh, in the way that... 
just uh, making headlines, you know, about uh, uh, spectacular art, but not so much going into the discussion. So I think um, when we are talking about, now we are uh, discussing more and more uh, about how to fit indigenous art into Western institutions and museums and such. Uh, I think we need to have a very philosoph uh, philosoph philosophy. Philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, approach to this whole thing because what's actually our biggest um, uh, trap or has been is the fact that we are mimicking, uh, um, we are already colonized in, in all of our uh, levels of society, like just mimicking uh, the Norwegian parliament with the Sami parliament that is actually just uh, um, a political... Um, I don't know, glansbild. Uh, it, do it doesn't have any political power, but still um, the Norwegian government uh, is obliged to um, consult the Sami parliament, but then um, they choose themselves if they listen to, to what, what's being said. And, and I think now the reason why uh, people are um, starting to talk about like the Sami rage in, in arts is because now we are facing uh, the real big questions like uh, the industrialization uh, of our lands that we uh, desperately depend on. And for instance, also this forced call of reindeer, Sami reindeer herds, which I see as a, as a result of the uh, shrinking of, of land or even uh, in the competition of, of the resources. Um, Maybe, maybe this is simplifying it a little bit from what Christine sa uh, says about the way that uh, Canada uh, tackles Inuit art or looks at Inuit uh, art or, or, or sees it as an integral part of Canadian culture. It sounds like you, you almost wish you were Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, the Canadians wish that, uh, that they were, that the Inuits were like the Sami artists. <laughs> no, it, I think it's... There, there's a lot of cross-fertilization that could happen there between Sami and Inuit artists. Mm -hmm. And definitely Pailo Sami uh, is a reference to uh, a Canadian um, colonial history and North American colonial history. It's diffi uh, very uh, mm -hmm. crucial that we have uh, a dialogue uh, about our um, stories and uh, our current situations, definitely. This is not about one country, but at least it, it sounds to me like uh, Lord Volker Fredriksen has changed his political standpoint a little bit because when he was cultural mayor of Oslo uh, 17 years ago, he uh, was part of slashing the cultural budget, especially for the independent grassroots artists. I, I don't know if you recall that. No. <laughs> you cut the budget by 3%, and uh, when you explained why, you said it was more important to give the money to schools, and at least you were able to present the... Uh, prevent the, sla the budgets of the major institutions of being slashed. Uh, it was probably wise at that time. <laughs> <laughs> How about now? <laughs> uh, uh, this was uh, 20 years ago, I think. Uh, and, uh, of course, a budget is something that shall uh, balance every year. So, uh, uh, what, what the priorities are uh, in 1999 and today uh, can depend on uh, what uh, economic situation we are in. I don't remember that at all. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll show you the quote in, in Aftenposten. But, yeah, Duba? I, I, I need to react to one of the comments that was said yeah. before. So you, you said that like, now use the window of opportunity, but this window of opportunity has always been existing here. It's not like happening something very specific now. Sorry, I have to say, because <laughs> um, um, the art and critical thinking through the art uh, and across the borders have, has existed like for 20, 25 years at least, uh, also up here, uh, up here in the north. And it happened not because some Someone from you know from Oslo tried to fit us artists or northern uh, institutions into the cultural policy created somewhere uh, in the capital is because uh, so we people living in the north and urging for this kind of uh, artistic critical reflection for us it is existential it's not something as far as I see it's not something 
uh, that you know we, for example, want to philosophize with uh, uh, with someone from outside, but we do want that. But for us, it's first of all existential. So all these bottom-up um, uh, initiatives that are starting. Uh, so that's it, it, it's all up to us. It's up to you that you started, uh, you know, growing in Kautokeino. It's all up to us. Speaking of Brun, when we saw this window of opportunities in the end of 90s, when uh, the border uh, with Russia uh, got more transparent and uh, more accessible. So um, uh, I think this window of opportunities exists all the time, and it's up to us, to the uh, actors and agents, <laughs> um, um, wherever we are, whether in the Russian Arctic or in the Norwegian Arctic, to grasp this opportunity. But it's always there, it's not only now. Marins Markham, but I'd just like to hear, if I could just ask Christine first, uh, this there is, a, there is a sense of urgency in what uh, Luba is saying that uh, not necessarily a window of opportunity just now, but an, a, a, a continuing necessity of, of catching the possibilities to promote, uh, to promote the identity of, of the North. Do, do you feel the same? Do you feel I, something <coughs> like there this? There is a sense of urgency, but there has always been a sense yeah. of urgency. Um, they have been saying Inuit art is dead since the 1960s and it's still alive. <laughs> I think it was um, <coughs> um, Natar Ungoluk who said that as long as there is rock, there will be Inuit art. And as long as people have something to express... In the sense of, of, of ground, not the music, I, I assume. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but both now, because yeah. music, of course, and yeah. the performing arts are flourishing in the Arctic yeah. as well. But it, it, there is an urgency because... Um, you know, one analogy that comes to mind often about Inuit art today is that it, it, it's like a, a large tree and it's flourishing in the south, but the roots, there are, um, at the grassroots level, there is a problem. There are no heritage centers in every community. There's no place to see Inuit art in most communities. Um, the, there's no um, art schools. There's a very good system that Inuit um, learn by, which is essentially a, a family apprentice system that has been going on for generations and generations. But there's no support or recognition of that. Mm. Um, artists have problems um, accessing even tools and materials. Mm. Um, they're really um, reliant on a system that is um, both on the one side funding and on the other side market. Um, and even being in a position to determine, I want to make a piece, can I get the tools and materials, and can I say what I want to say, will the market like it, is a, a, a dilemma for most artists in the North today. So there's an urgency to fix that problem. There are fewer artists in the North nowadays um, because of that. It's a difficult choice to be an artist, whereas in generations past, uh, whole families uh, would be working together. So a bit of a paradox. You know, there's never been more interest globally in the Arctic, but it's hard to be an artist. Mm -hmm. Marit, you were? Yeah, but now I oh, so, <laughs> I'm so sorry. But, there was something yeah. uh, from the previous, and now I'm thinking something totally different. So, yeah. <laughs> sorry about that, Marit. Maybe yeah. I'll just one other... Um, <clears throat> I mean, mine is only one perspective, um, mm. but these are just things that I, I have observed in the times that I've been going up north and things that have changed. But um, with the creation, uh, there are four northern regions in Canada. Um, um, but specifically about Nunavut, um, you know, the Inuit have achieved a great deal of self-determination in terms of their um, government and the way their communities are organized. Um, but I think that's what's needed in the arts, is a self-determination of, of how they um, create and how they um, relay that to the world. We are getting close to the, the end of the discussion here. It was, it's been much too brief and I didn't expect it to give any answers, but uh, you who are sitting here are among some of the most, whether you know it or not, you're some of the most powerful players in a way in, in Arctic culture. You have tremendous uh, possibility here to, to affect the, uh, this first Arctic Art Summit, in, uh, and I hope you'll have some wonderful breakaway sessions in just a moment. I just want to hear if there are any closing remarks from any of our panelists on some, what, some of the things that have been said here. It's, this is meant as some basis for you to discuss in at the different, uh, different panels. I think are all of you parts of, of panels, I forget, uh, I think you, you are. Marit, you have one thing? 
Yeah, I just wanted to, since you're asking, uh, for me, it's very difficult to be sitting here in this panel, like, because yesterday there is so much talk about, um, you know, uh, the politics, institutions, money, resources in North, even us people were uh, called resources several times yeah. yesterday. So uh, the discussion, I feel, is very difficult. Um, but, uh, okay, it's a starting point. Uh, we'll so, yeah. You, you would like to stop all the, you'd like to, the politicians to stop talking about monetizing the, uh, the culture and make yeah, it into North, worthwhile. Us, uh, yeah. remember that uh, we're people <laughs> trying to live here and uh, not everything is. The North um, seems to be considered more as, um, as a resource for the um, development of the world uh, in other areas. So every, um, yesterday also I was very intrigued by, um, there was a Danish speaker uh, who was asking like critical questions about the tourist industry development. Mm. Uh, because here, uh, in my opinion, <coughs> we, we don't even dare to ask critical questions because that's the only other choice next to the mining industry that the Norwegian government is forcing up uh, north. So it's like, okay, as long as we don't have mining, then okay, bring the Tories, whatever, like, we're so... We're opening a whole new area here <laughs> of discussion. <laughs> and at the, at the, at, and I'm, really, I'm really worried about Arthur because last I saw him, he was armed with tennis balls and I, I'd really <laughs> rather not have him start throwing them at us. Luba, for an ultra short, ultra I, I, short I have to remark. react to that. I think uh, we, whether we are artists or politicians or economists, we have to be able to speak different languages. And when we speak with the politicians, we have to speak about the art being a resource. When we speak about the, um, uh, or, or instrumental, you know, to, to create um, um, uh, the vitality of the northern communities. When we speak with the um, foreign, uh, with, with, with politicians, uh, you know, who work across the borders, we have to speak about the art uh, being um, uh, a, a, a bridge build. I think we have to also there uh, being able to get out of our uh, comfort zones as artists or art producers, also speak, uh, being able to speak all these different languages about the resources uh, so that we can start finding some kind of a balance because when he, we he live here in the North, it's not like black and white. It's not uh, about resources or not resources. It's, about, it's not about oil or not oil. Um, uh, we, we all want nickel uh, because we do want to use our iPhones, uh, so it's not about closing down the nickel uh, uh, smelter uh, uh, completely. So we, we are, we, I think we should be aware of these trade-offs that we have to take. Uh, politicians have to take these trade-offs, economists have to tra take these trade-offs, and we artists and artistic communities There's also have to be taking these trade-offs. an opening at least here saying that not, not all, not all uh, grassroots artists are are wanting money all the time here. Timo, just a very, and I really will have to ask yeah, you to yes, be very yeah, short there. Yes, I got Luba's idea about that uh, discussion, but not only with the policy, policy maker, but uh, what I think that artists and artists should learn to discuss with other sector of society, like uh, those who are building our environment. We have this kind of aesthetic knowledge and quality understanding, but we don't have language. And that's a big issue, in, I think, in our university education system to renovate this art, art school, schooling artists in a way that they are able to communicate with language that other people understand. I mean, and, and that's not, uh, not, not <laughs> nothing against the language of art. But on, uh, that, on that note, we are going to have to stop because I have <laughs> promised to make sure. <laughs> I'm so sorry about it. Uh, on that note, we are going to have to stop. Uh, I would like to, before I say thank you to our panelists, just to tell you that the, common, the, the coming breakaway sessions are at the university building next door, so you will have to leave this room, go out in an orderly fashion and go to the, the uh, neighboring building. You will pass a band, and, uh, and, and it's not really there for you. You can pretend it is. It's because they're inaugurating a new pier. So I, I hear there might be music, if you would like to think it's for you, then give a casual wave as you go by, but otherwise, please continue to the auditorium. I would like to say thank you very much on, for a much too short discussion to Luba, to Christine, to Marit, to Broad, and to Timo. Thank you very much, and have a great day. <laughs>